Thank you, Dr. Sanders. Thank you for your presentation. And right now we are moving to our last topic, which is the common myth on creatine. And this topic is going to be covered by three speakers. Uh, Dr. Jose Antonio from uh, Nova South Eastern University, Dr. Scott, uh, Scott Forbes from Brandon University, Canada, and from Dr. Trisha van Dieseldorf uh, from University uh, Kennesaw uh, State University, USA. Welcome all of you and thank you so much. Well, I want to welcome everyone to the Creatine Conference 2022. This is actually the grand finale. Uh, we are going to cover safety and common myths about creatine supplementation. And with me today are Drs. Trisha Van Dusseldorp and Dr. Scott Forbes. A little bit about them. Um, Dr. Trisha Van Dusseldorp, she's currently the president of the International Society of Sports Nutrition, and her home is in Kennesaw State University in Georgia. So southern state and and moving north <laughs> dr scott forbes up in manitoba if you can find that on the map up in canada uh dr forbes is at brandon university and both dr forbes and dr van dusseldorp do quite a bit of work on sports nutrition and supplementation and they're here to um hopefully dispute some of the common myths associated with creatine and really just edify the audience on things related to creatine so Let's start off with this. Um, I think one of the more common, uh, I guess, issues or complaints about creatine from both coaches, parents, et cetera, are these myths that keep popping up. And so I want you to address some of the more common myths, uh, uh, Scott, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the common myths is that creatine causes kidney or renal dysfunction. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the physiology or metabolism of creatine. So creatine and phosphocreatine are degraded non-enzymatically into creatinine. And uh, creatinine goes through, is filtered through the liver and kidneys and it's excreted. And we know that if you uh, supplement with creatine, then creatinine levels tend to increase. Um, they also increase if you have more muscle mass and if you eat more meat in your diet. Um, but that marker creatinine has been used as a indicator of kidney dysfunction. And we know based off of those studies that if you supplement with creatine, that's gonna go up, but that does not actually indicate any kidney or renal dysfunction. No, I'm so glad you a, mentioned, a I'm glad, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm glad you mentioned that Dr. Forbes, cause that is a common, not a common complaint, but it's brought up often. An athlete will say, hey, I went to my doctor, mm -hmm. uh, serum creatinine was elevated, and he said, there's something wrong with my kidneys. So just, just sort of hone that point in so that people know what, you know what this is about. Yeah, absolutely. So um, basically, that's a normal metabolic uh, process of creatine supplementation, and that does not actually indicate any kidney dysfunction. So the studies that have actually looked at kidney dysfunction show that um, there is no evidence that creatine supplementation in healthy individuals consuming a typical amount of creatine will cause any impairment to their kidneys. And Trisha, do you think there's any issues with women? Because I've noticed whenever I've tried to do investigations on creatine with women, they're always afraid of basically weight gain. Um, so how do women, if they do differ from men in terms of the response to creatine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there's way less data on women um, and creatine compared to men despite decades of research. I remember one of the uh, initial studies that I read in 1991, so I would have been three years old at that time. So I clearly, I clearly wasn't reading it when I was three. Um, but Forsberg came out with this excellent paper highlighting data that women had higher, approximately 10% intermuscular creatine stores uh, than their male counterparts, which ultimately led to this idea that creatine might not be beneficial for women or they might not respond in the same manner. But ultimately today, even with limited research in women compared to men, we know that it increases strength, power, and athletic performance, but body weight doesn't really change. Women are scared of taking creatine because they think that they're going to gain all this weight, but there's been a ton of investigations in terms of acute loading, 
no loading at all, longer term supplementation in women, and it doesn't show increases in body mass. That data tends to be more in men, where men supplement acutely with the loading phase or chronically, and they tend to see some changes in body mass. So it's definitely a um, myth. It can happen, but those changes aren't often significant, you know, a pound, maybe two pounds. So otherwise, would the performance changes be similar between men and women? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Increases in strength, increases in power, increases in athletic performance. And that occurs in both pre and post menopausal women. So throughout the lifespan, we're seeing that. Interesting. How about, um, I mean, we know it, it elevates lean body mass in both men and women. What about fat mass? Are there any changes in body fat? Because obviously that would be a concern. I mean, if you're putting on lean mass and putting on fat mass at the same time, it kind of defeats the purpose, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in again here uh, if you don't mind, Scott. But this seems to be a myth, myth that floats around a lot, drives me a bit mad, but there's this idea among many people that creatine increases fat mass and it's likely due to the increase in just overall body mass. And they tend to jump to this conclusion that they start taking creatine and they're putting on fat. And that's very much unsupported in the data. There have been acute studies and longer studies, 32 weeks up to a year, that have shown no changes in fat mass and even reductions at times. And this has been done in college age men, women, athletes, swimmers, bodybuilders, and older adults. And, and I'll just highlight Scott's recent uh, meta-analysis and systematic review in older adults, um, because women are often afraid of you know, putting on fat mass, but older adults too, because it gets harder to maintain body mass and, and reductions in fat mass that they, they conducted this excellent systematic review meta-analysis on over 600 subjects. Uh, and they were 50 years and older and involved resistance training, creatine supplementation, and they found no, all right, no changes uh, in, or increases in body fat percentage. Um, and that at times older adults actually lost about, I think it was about half a kilogram of fat mass. Um, so ultimately you can summarize and conclude that creatine supplementation doesn't <laughs> increase fat mass, that, that it's beneficial for just maintenance of, of body weight. Well, that's, I mean, that's a great thing. Body composition has certainly improved the creatine. Um, I think historically, people have thought of creatine as a bodybuilding supplement, when in fact, the endurance community may actually benefit from this. And so, Scott, could you comment on that? Because I participate in endurance sport. I know Trisha, she's always on her bike, just like my wife, always riding the dang bike. What about us endurance people? Does it help? Well, that, that's a great question. And it's a bit of a nuanced answer. Um, so it could benefit in certain situations, but it might actually impair performance in other situations. Um, so it can actually help with glycogen resynthesis. So if you take creatine with carbohydrates, you can get more glycogen within your muscles, which of course is benefit to uh, endurance athletes. Um, but as previously, previously discussed, you can also put on a little bit of body mass as well. And that could actually impair for example, running performance. So the data is a little bit mixed um, with regards to endurance performance, but there's definitely certain situations where it can be a benefit. Now, it's interesting you mentioned running because that's the one activity where it can be kind of equivocal, but what about it, when you're cycling, your body weight supported, when I'm paddling, my body weight supported, would you view it differently because we're not technically carrying our weight? it's being carried by an implement. Yeah, absolutely. So it's probably a benefit for cyclists um, or stand-up paddle boarders or kayakers um, in those situations. And then the other uh, time it might be of benefit is where you have to change pace. Um, so go from slow speeds to higher speeds or have a good finishing kick as well. So there could be of benefits in those situations. And it's been actually shown in um, in cyclists performing a 120 kilometer time trial where they had to change their pace every 10 kilometers. And they showed improvements in the last two changes of pace um, in that 120 kilometer time trial. And that was again in cyclists. That's a hell of a long time trial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, there is this thing, and, and I get this from my undergrad students a lot, um, is creatine a steroid? <laughs> Um, I'll answer that one as well. And uh, it's obviously 
obviously not a steroid. So it's derived of three amino acids, arginine, glycine, and methionine. And it has a completely different chemical structure than, than a steroid. So yeah, I, I don't know why that myth persists. It's, it's just crazy how every year I get that same question. Um, now, before I get to sort of the sort of the question dealing with the future, some I, I guess some new data or or maybe people are starting to look at it more, the role of creatine in affecting cognition in the brain. So if both of you can comment on that, because I know uh, as exercise scientists, we don't typically you know, think of the brain, although we should, because it probably limits a lot of exercise. What is that data starting to look like in terms of people who eat meat, people who don't eat meat, um, how creatine supplementation might affect the brain? Looking positive, Joey. It's looking positive, really. I'll let Scott highlight some of the specifics, but yeah, there's some great data, uh, especially in animal models on neuroprotective effects uh, associated with athletic performance and concussions. Um, and I'll let Scott talk about some of his work because I know he's done a lot in this area. Yeah, absolutely. And we know that if you supplement with creatine, you can increase the amount of creatine within your brain. And that seems to uh, benefit cognitive processing. So you can enhance attention, uh, executive function, like decision-making, um, memory as well. So there's seems to be some benefits. And then particularly when the brain is stressed. So if you're sleep deprived or have a concussion or traumatic brain injury or hypoxia, it seems to be of great benefit. Now, there was a recent, I think it was a rodent study, um which looked at creatine uptake into the brain versus skeletal muscle. And the question is this, it seems to be uptaked into skeletal muscle a lot easier than the brain. So, and I don't think we have data on this yet, but would you speculate on the dosing needed to affect the brain versus skeletal muscle? And, and is five grams a day adequate? Do we need more for the brain? Is it 10 grams a day? I, I don't know if there's an answer. Maybe <laughs> you guys have an yeah. answer for that. I'd I can totally hire. Yeah, go ahead, Scott, please. Um, yeah, so we actually, we don't know um, the optimal dose, um, but it's yeah speculated that a higher dose may be required. So we have fewer brain or creatine transporters at the brain. And so it's a little bit more challenging to get creatine into the brain, but we can also synthesize creatine in our brain as well. So that's um, something that needs to be taken into account. And I know I take it oftentimes just for my head. I feel better. I have no interest in gaining weight as it is. It's not going to help me any. Um, so, so I assume both of you take creatine daily. Daily. See, I like it when uh, when my students say, you know, when professors practice what they preach, they're always happy. You know, to us, it's not a th theoretical thing. Now, I'd like to end this uh, um, sort of mini uh, seminar we're giving here on future work in creatine. Where do you think? you know, moving forward, some of the cool new things will be in creatine or things that you personally are going to study in the next few years with, with regards to creatine. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, personally, I think we need more research in women. There's a good amount of data, but especially women, and there's some data coming out and some research on this topic, but menstrual cycle, how it impacts the menstrual cycle and symptoms associated uh, with the menstrual cycle and performance uh, during that time period for women. And then I personally, and we're doing this in our lab, uh, we're going to start looking at some creatine across pre, peri, and post menopausal uh, phases with exercise training. So looking at really efficient uh, training periods, uh, you know, 30 minute resistance training circuits or high intensity interval training, trying to get some time efficient uh, training methods in combination with creatine to see how that impacts not only body composition, uh, but also bone bone health, bone density, bone turnover. And then we've been talking about it, these, these ideas of mood and cognition, improving vigilance and attention and overall mood states. I think it's an exciting area. Um, I think that especially in the older adults, it's, it's very much novel. Uh, you just need the team to do it. You need a lot of people True, <laughs> to help with those training studies, right? But I, it could have a great impact, I think, on middle-aged older adult females. Scott? Yeah, there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered, um, whether cycling on and off creatine versus taking creatine continuously daily is of any further benefit. Um, so I think that study needs to be done. But uh, from a clinical perspective, looking at creatine following concussions can it aid in recovery um, or 
also uh, potentially some clinical or occupational professions as well. Like, can creatine be a benefit for firefighters? They're sleep deprived. They need to make decisions quickly, and they also need to do uh, lots of physical work as well. And creatine, in theory, could be a benefit in all three of those situations. Yeah, and also I will likely pursue some of the work on creatine as it affects cognition, um, because I think, uh, I mean, certainly the brain is, I guess you could call it the last frontier because it's so difficult to study. And then the idea, you know, what's interesting, Tricia, you brought up, we need more studies than women. And I'll be quite honest, it's much harder to recruit women for these studies than men. I mean, men, they'll volunteer for anything if they get free, free supplements. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, maybe I'm not good at selling it to women. Maybe you could give pointers to us scientists who are trying to get women more involved in studies. You know, what's, what's interesting, uh, you're right. It is more difficult, especially with creatine because they're scared of, females tend to be more scared of, of the potential weight gain. So if you can get past that, uh, supervised training, uh, does it? We tend to have very, very high adherence if you've got supervised training where there's a, more of a one-on-one -on -one feel. Our female subjects tend to, to like that. But again, you've got to have the personnel to put that type of study on. Um, and during the pandemic, it's been much more difficult uh, with getting people into the lab, but hopefully we're past that. Well, I want to thank uh, both uh, Dr. Tricia Van Dusseldorp and Dr. Scott Forbes for edifying the audience on creatine. Uh, that's all we have today. And so uh, again, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully you guys have learned a lot.